So thanks to PacBio for inviting me to give this talk. My name is Meredith Gorst, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington. Today, I'm going to talk about the evolution and function of a large tandem repeat associated with ALS. So let's talk about tandem repeats. So over 40 tandem repeats are currently known to be involved in neurological disease. And the vast majority of these summarized here are short tandem repeats, or STRs. So these are repeats with a repeat unit of six or fewer base pairs. But with the advent of long read sequencing technology, we've seen evidence for the role of much larger tandem repeats or variable number tandem repeats in neurological disease as well. So the two examples I'm showing you here were identified due to proximity to a GWAS signal, which they may account for. But we hypothesize that there are going to be a lot more of these really large tandem repeats involved in neurological disease. So we wanted to take a top-down approach to identify other candidates to study. So what I mean by that is we identified certain characteristics of other tandem repeats involved in neurological disease. For example, uh, they were human-specific, intronic, non-mobile element insertions. And we developed a list of 20 VNTRs shown here on the y-axis. Um, these are candidate VNTRs to look at. Now here in this particular project, we were interested in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. This is a rapidly progressive and uniformly fatal motor neuron disease. So here what I'm showing, showing you are the links of these VNTRs in the answer ALS data set. And what you can see is that one VNTR in particular uh, was particularly variable. So variability in size and length was one of the characteristics we were most interested in. So we zoomed in on this VNTR a little closer. So this VNTR lives in the final intron of a gene called WDR7, which incidentally, this gene also encodes a protein involved in synaptic transmission. So what we can see here is that this repeat is expanded in humans, um, but it's not expanded in any other vertebrates. And each repeat unit is 69 base pairs long. So this is the largest repeat expansion in terms of repeat unit size that has been characterized in this way. So we wanted to know, is this repeat more expanded in cases of sporadic ALS? And we found that it was. So first, looking in short read whole genome sequencing data sets, we found that on average, so for example, here I'm showing you sporadic ALS cases in a cohort from Quebec. Um, on average, the length of this expansion is longer as compared to controls. And again, in the answer ALS database as well, on average, this um, repeat is, is expanded longer uh, in cases as compared to controls. We wanted to confirm this finding in a third cohort. And we also wanted to look at, um, be able to resolve both alleles. So in short read whole genome sequencing, you're estimating an average length. But instead, we wanted to be able to resolve both alleles. So we got a third cohort of samples. These are sporadic ALS samples from the Coriel Institute. And we performed, um, we performed PCR amplification of the repeat region. And we were able to resolve both alleles in most, most cases. So the sporadic ALS cases are shown in orange. And we saw yet again that this repeat expansion was significantly longer in the cases of sporadic ALS. So together, this suggests to us that uh, this repeat does play some role in modifying disease susceptibility. And while we're on this graph, I'll point out that the longest repeat expansion we've seen so far is, this, uh, is 86 copies long. And that belonged to an individual who developed ALS at the age of 72. So in addition to looking at repeat unit size or repeat expansion size, uh, we were interested in looking at internal nucleotide structure. And the reason for that is that there is increasing evidence that internal nucleotide sequence can play a role in disease susceptibility as well. So we turned to long read PAC bio sequencing of a subset of, of this Coriel cohort. And what we found was indeed there was variability in the repeat unit. So if this is one example copy of 169 bar, base pair repeat unit, we found 18 variations on that repeat unit that accounted for over 99% of all the repeat units that we saw. And the variability in, in this repeat unit occurred at exactly six locations. So those are these colorful letters. So six, six base pairs out of 69 are the only ones that change. So there's some sort of pressure to, um, to keep the majority of the base pairs the same, either functional or something having to do with how it replicates. But it's not random. 
when we look at the distribution of these repeat units, we find that largely they're the same across uh, disease states. So we don't believe that internal nucleotide sequence plays a role in disease susceptibility. However, once we saw this variability, we wanted to know what's driving this distribution. Is it that most people just have one repeat unit or is it that most people have a variety of repeat units? What does this look like on the global scale? So to answer this question, we assigned a color code to each of the repeat units and then we plotted each repeat allele as a series of colors. So I'll show you what that looks like here. So on the y-axis, we're counting repeat unit copies, and then we're gonna plot each allele top to bottom in the five prime to three prime direction. And then we're gonna line them all up, each allele on the x-axis. So in this just example of three alleles I'm showing you here, this allele has 18 repeat unit copies, this allele has two, and this allele has 20. And then there's a variety of colors here indicating that they have a variety of internal nucleotide sequence. So if we plot all of the repeats that we long read sequenced, and there are about 260 alleles, some patterns immediately emerge. So for example, first we note that these alleles align far better to the three prime end than they do to the five prime end. So there's more variability on the five prime end, suggesting that this repeat expands in the three prime to five prime direction. We also note this kind of clustering of different patterns. And that indicates to us that some variation originated independently, kind of like haplogroups. We also see instances of duplication events. So instances where these kind of different uh, stripes of color look like they've been copied and pasted. So we know that this repeat partially expands via duplication events. But overall, what we get is this sense of striping or stripiness. And what that is, is that you rarely see a block of all the same color. So you rarely see all the same internal nucleotide sequence, which is surprising to me. So to quantify that observation, for each repeat unit sequence, we calculated how many positions away from itself it would appear again. And we did that for each repeat unit and we summed them together. And when we did that, we found this remarkable periodicity in which you are far more likely to see the same repeat unit sequence an even number of positions away from itself than you are to see it an odd number of positions away. So much so that you're more likely to see the same repeat unit sequence 26 positions away from itself than you are to see it right next to itself or one position away. Now, one part of the graph that I think um, kind of encapsulates a couple of these patterns is this little bumblebee looking unit here. So the black color, what that indicates, this is a new repeat unit. This is not one of those 18 that we had seen um, account for most of the repeat units. And so it's a new repeat unit, and accordingly, it's on the five prime end, which we hypothesize to be the new end of this expansion. And when it has expanded, it has brought along its yellow partner. So it has expanded in the three to five prime direction and in multiples of two. And those two observations together, the directionality and the multiples of two, uh, suggest to us that this repeat expands by a, a mechanism of replication called template switching. So let me explain what I mean by that. So first of all, because this expands in the three to five prime direction, we think that the replication error that leads to its expansion occurs on the lagging strand. That's the, the strand that is, uh, um, that is replicated in the three to five prime direction. And replication on the lagging strand occurs in fragments called Okazaki fragments. Interestingly, two of our WDR7 repeats is exactly the same size as one Okazaki fragment. I'll file that away for a moment. So template switching is a replication error that occurs on the lagging strand. What happens is that during replication of repetitive tracks larger than one Okazaki fragment, sometimes the nascent leading strand will switch from its template to the nascent lagging strand because they're complementary. Uh, and what this ultimately results in is an expansion that's exactly the same size as one Okazaki fragment, which again is the same size as two of our W-7 repeats. So this helps to account for both the directionality and the fact that we see these repeats expanding in multiples of two. Okay, so we learn a lot from this one plot. We see a lot of patterns that suggest to us how it might be expanding. However, we wanted to know if we were to repeat this analysis in a more diverse cohort, would we see these same patterns? So this cohort was largely from samples of self-reported European ancestry 
And in addition, we had originally filtered um, for size, so we had wanted to look at longer repeats when we when we perform pack biosequencing. But in the next graph I'm going to show you, we use thousand genomes project samples, for example, and some and some others to increase diversity in our sample set. We also did not filter for size. So you're going to see a lot more of the shorter repeat uh, expansions as well. And when we do that, what we find is all the same patterns appear again. So this is reproducible. Um, in fact, sometimes we see some of the same clusters that we recognize from that previous graph. We also do see some new clusters appear. Um, for example, this tower here is specific to individuals upon Chinese descent. Um, and this cluster over here is specific to individuals um, of African ancestry. So there is some population specificity that comes out. Now, in addition to looking at this on this global scale, we also use long read sequencing to look at this allele in one very large family. And by doing so, we were able to show that this repeat does not show intergenerational instability. So in those short tandem repeats involved in neurological disease, um, there's something called genetic anticipation where or contraction, um, where the repeat will change size between generations is somewhat common. But we don't see that with this larger tandem repeat. You can actually use the exact allele color pattern and watch it be inherited en masse between the generations. So this is expanding on a much longer time scale than generation to generation. So if we think about that longer time scale, if we look back at other primates, we find that there's nothing that looks like this repeat in mouse lemurs. But then in old world monkeys, new world monkeys, and gibbons, we see something that is 47 out of those 69 base pairs. So it's about two thirds of that repeat unit shows up. And then once we reach great apes, excluding humans, that's when we finally get one complete 69 base pair copy of the repeat. And then of course, once we reach humans, we see a huge amount of expansion. If we zoom in a little closer on humans, we look at archaic humans, we find that this repeat is expanded in those genomes as well. So first, looking at uh, Neanderthals, you can see that the read depth in the repeat region, this is short read sequencing, uh, is not very deep. But if we look at individual repeat reads, we're able to use those, um, the internal repeat sequence that we had determined from long read sequencing, we're able to apply here back to this short read sequencing and be able to see that, in fact, there are at least four different internal nucleotide sequences in the Neanderthals. So we know that it is a little bit expanded. And then in Denisovans, you can see there's much greater read depth in this region. And accordingly, uh, we see a greater variability in internal nucleotide sequence as well. And we're able to match um, modern, some modern day alleles to the relative numbers of these repeat unit sequences in Denisovans. So it's certainly more, more expanded in, in Denisovans. Thinking more about modern day populations, we find that by and large, now this is Thousand Genomes Project population samples, we find that this, the repeat expansion is about the same size across superpopulations. However, there are some repeat units that are specific to certain superpopulations. For example, this sort of hot pink repeat unit here is specifically absent only in the admixed American superpopulation. And then this sort of bright blue repeat unit is absent specifically in the East Asian superpopulation. So again, there's some population specificity. Finally, thinking a little bit about function, what is this repeat doing? That 69 base pair uh, repeat unit is actually complementary. It forms this really stable hairpin structure that is reminiscent of a microRNA precursor. And in fact, we were able to use short read sequencing to show that uh, with increasing repeat copy number, we see increasing number of microRNAs produced from this repeat. And so this, this repeat is able to produce microRNAs. In addition, this structure also has three different binding sites predicted to be associated um, with um, RNA binding proteins known to be involved in ALS. So FUF, TDP43, and HNRNPA1. So it may act to sequester these RNA binding proteins. Finally, we've also been able to show that the RNA from this repeat can form aggregates, uh, and that happens in the cytoplasm. So here with increasing repeat copy number, we see increasing number of these speckles, which, are, which indicate the presence of RNA aggregates, both in MEF cells and in HEX cells. Um, and we've actually been able to recently show this in patient lymphoblasts as well, a more physiological model. 
That's brand new data. So let me conclude by summarizing what I've told you so far. So there's a human specific 69 base pair repeat expansion in a gene called WDR7. And repeat copy number is modestly but significantly higher in cases of sporadic ALS, suggesting that it plays a role in modifying disease susceptibility. Long read PAC biosequencing reveals this incredible internal nucleotide pattern which itself reveals that this repeat expands via duplication events and by a mechanism like template switching or something similar. We also see evidence of some population specificity of this repeat. And finally, we ha have some ideas of its possible function. It can form microRNAs, it can aggregate, and it may sequester RNA binding proteins involved in ALS. In the final moments, I just want to acknowledge my lab led by Paul Waldmanis. Uh, and a lot of the individuals, all of these individuals were co-authors on the paper describing this work. It was a true team effort. Uh, and these are some of our sources of funding and whole genome sequencing data. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>